Hello, everyone. Good morning and, and welcome. My name is Tim Ralph. I'm a managing partner here at Biltmore Capital. Um, and for all of our international clients, uh, buen viendo, buen venu. Uh, joining me today is Dr. Donald Chambers, Chief Investment Officer of Biltmore Select Portfolios. And on today's call, we're going to be discussing the recent COVID-19 outbreak and its impact on the economy, markets, and what this means for your portfolio and retirement plan. I know it's an uncomfortable and anxious time in our world. Uh, it brings back memories of 9-11 when the world was brought to its knees with fear and panic. Many industries suffered during that time. The economy was fragile, but it did recover in the coming days, months, and years. Ultimately, it was the human psyche that was changed forever. I remember shortly after that terrible day, I had to get on a plane to go visit my brother at school. And as we boarded the plane, you could see the fear in people's eyes. You know, was this safe? What are we doing getting on an airplane? Uh, I always remember the captain who came over the loudspeaker addressing the obvious concerns of passengers. He was very reassuring, telling us the exact flight plan. Well, ladies and gentlemen, shortly after takeoff, we're going to be banking to the right, then working our way to a cruising altitude of 33,000 feet. There will be some minor turbulence as we fly through 16,000 feet. This is normal. As we get close to our final destination, we'll begin our descent over Lake Michigan. We expect to feel some bumps as we descend through 3,000 feet. And this is because the wind comes off the water and hits the sea, uh, cityscape and creates turbulence. This is normal. Our arrival will be on runway 32 in Chicago, flight time two hours and 20 minutes. So please sit back, relax, and don't worry. This is our first rodeo, you're in good hands. And it was only after the captain went through his plan with a tone of confidence, highlighting the expectations of the flight, that the tensions were eased and passengers were able to relax and calm their fears. But 9-11 changed our world forever. This epidemic, too, will have its lasting impact on the world. To quote Winston Churchill, now is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. But it is perhaps the end of the beginning. And while we don't know how long this epidemic will last, we do know that the human race will create, cure, and innovate. And that's some of the silver lining. I'm going to pass the microphone over to Dr. Chambers, who's going to take you back in history and provide some insight on markets, business, and the economy. Following Dr. Chambers, we'll allow plenty of time for Q&A. If you have any questions, kindly submit your questions in the section in the questions section of the webinar, or feel free to email me or your advisors, and we'll try to get your questions as soon as possible. We've already compiled a number of questions coming from many of the conversations we've had over the last day, and we hope to address those as well. Now, without further ado, I'm going to hand over the microphone again to Don. Uh, Don, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Tim. That was a, a great introduction. Uh, the times are a little uh, unsettling, and I hope that this webinar will uh, put things in context. Uh, I'll begin uh, with the discussion of the of the financial uh, panics or, or uh, depressions and recessions that, that, that I've lived through. Uh, and in fact, before my, my career began, of course, uh, is the Great Depression. And just to put it in context, uh, from, the, from its high in 1929 to its, its low uh, a couple years later, uh, the, the uh, Dow was down around 90%. So context of markets, um, we're now down in the 15 to 20 percent area from the all-time highs, and uh, this is rather small if we think in terms of the Great Depression, and uh, where in the first two or three years it fell 90 percent. I certainly remember a very dismal period from 1965 to 1982. Uh, during that time period, the stock market actually fell about 70 percent, and it was a, a horrible time in many other ways. We were, uh, double-digit inflation and oil prices going up. And uh, I remember it just seemed to be a time when we uh, lacked uh, uh, confidence in our economy, and, and perhaps rightly so. Uh, that was not a quick event. In October of 87 was a quick event that I remember very vividly. I remember every day of it. Uh, and 
if, if it's interesting that the Dow was approximately one tenth of what it is now. So to put it in today's terms, what happened in 1987 was that the Dow on a Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday fell almost the equivalent of a thousand points in today's Dow Jones. Uh, it was uh, uh, closer to 100 back then, but it fell about 1,000 in today's uh, Dow Dowers. On Wednesday, again, on Thursday, it dropped a bunch. On Friday, it dropped over 1,000. And then on the Monday, it dropped the equivalent of almost 5,000 Dow points in, in today's markets. We saw a 2,000-point drop in our Dow a couple days ago, but this October 87 crash was four days without any let up with a total decline of almost 33%. And that was a decline from the all-time high of 40%. The thing I want to emphasize about the October 87 crash is there wasn't a reason for it. When we think about today, we can talk about the virus. We can talk about possibly the oil price uh, collapse. But in October of 1987, this was just uh, seemed to be a, a crash without any reason. And I think that's a natural part of, of, of life. Uh, I, I, I notice, uh, you know, people and even animals panic sometimes when there's no real reason for them to be doing so. In 2000 uh, was the dot-com or the internet bubble bursting, and that spilled over later to the overall stock market, and the stock market was down almost 50%. And then in 2007 and 8, which I imagine almost everybody remembers, the global financial crisis, the stock market was down over 50%. and um, uh, it took the financial sector with it. So the numbers, uh, in the large numbers, we could talk about a 90% decline of our Great Depression. The Japanese market went through a similar thing starting in 1989. And we can talk about large, uh, uh, but not once every century sort of crises where maybe the market goes down about 50%. And then we can talk about uh, declines of 20% or 15 to 20%. And they're, they're a little more common. So this is not that unusual of an event. And we certainly have reasons, at least, to explain why it might be occurring. This is a picture that goes back to 1994 of, of the S&P 500. And you'll notice one thing is that the stock market tends to go up slowly and down quickly. If we look in this middle sector, which was the global financial sector, we can see that in just a matter of a few months, it wiped out progress that had been made over years. So the, uh, the stock market is said to take the escalator up very slowly, somewhat slowly, and the elevator down. We get these quick downward movements uh, with large upward movements in the middle. I've highlighted in this upper right-hand corner where we are now, and uh, this is not a live uh, graph, so it would be down a little more than it's showing right now. And here's the key question that I think is on everybody's mind. Okay, we've experienced this drop of uh, 15 to 20 percent. Uh, is that going to be like the uh, dot com aftermath? Is it going to be like the Great Financial Crisis? Is it going to be worse? Is it going to be like the Great Depression? Uh, or is it going to be if you look at this right here, is it going to be like this with a recovery? Or is it going to be like in 2011 with a recovery? Is it going to be like in 1999 with a recovery? This was a huge bull market in which we just had this temporary panic, but then it, it, uh, it persisted, the, the growth persisted. So we don't know whether this is going to be followed like these instances with a bull market, or whether we're going to go further into the into a crash. And uh, uh, that's the obvious question. And um, uh, that's what this webinar is all about, is to try to get some context for, for this. Uh, the difference between uh, whether this is going to be a blip or a bang uh, will probably, I should add the word probably, be driven by underlying fundamental factors. How bad will the actual health effects of the coronavirus be uh, in the U.S. and worldwide? Uh, how badly will whatever happens disrupt trade and supply chains? Uh, the international concerns, the, the China uh, supply chains, and, and those sorts of fundamental economic issues. 
how badly will it shake consumer and business confidence? Even if, if the virus goes away, uh, it could fear itself cause send us into a uh, significant recession. And lastly, will oil, oil prices remain extremely volatile? These are the, the two reasons that we think that the stock market dropped. I frankly um, am not sure that the stock market is dropping entirely because of fundamental factors. It could be dropping just like it did in previous times. In fact, if we go back to this previous slide, we see this blip in the upper right hand corner. This is what happened in December of 2019. We all, I think, remember that. The stock market dropped between 10 and 15 percent for no apparent reason. I think we were due for another one of those. A stock market's reaching very high reason uh, levels, and I think that we were due for a, a, a correction. We wouldn't know if it was going to come now or in another three years, but uh, these um, fundamental reasons, I'm sorry, these fundamental reasons that I've talked about here uh, certainly explain what's going on now, but uh, maybe they maybe they really aren't the underlying reason. Maybe the stock market uh, was was uh, needed to to go through an adjustment for uh, technical uh, emotional reasons rather than underlying fundamental reasons. Uh, I think it's probably a combination of both. Well, let's take a look at the in history about the effect of other epidemics. This isn't a perfect analysis uh, because I don't think there's ever been a sudden reaction uh, like we've seen to this. This is a six month later change and a 12 month later change in the S&P 500. And it looks like, oh, maybe the uh, AIDS virus caused this. I don't think it caused it at all. It just happens to be that sometimes this market goes up and sometimes it goes down. And, but it shows that there's been an awful lot of other epidemics in which there's been little uh, immediate reaction, if any, and certainly no long-term reaction. So that's comforting. Is this really that different of a virus? Well, I'm not a medical expert, but my opinion is that uh, it's not that much different. Uh, I could be very wrong. It could uh, unfold in a, in a very dramatic way. But um, as Tim, I think, alluded to, the human spirit and, and our ability to solve problems uh, should not be underestimated. And there's much more, uh, many steps that can be taken if, if things continue to worsen. So I think if we look in the, in the uh, retrospective uh, perspective, the idea that a virus should be causing this level of a collapse uh, is probably not consistent with the historical data. So what do we do in a situation like this? And uh, going back to Tim's uh, excellent analogy with the airline pilot, he kind of went over the idea of what we always do. Uh, we, you know, we're going to take this flight, we're going to have some turbulence, we're going to uh, uh, go up and we're going to come down, and, and uh, that's what we should normally expect. So let's talk about what we should expect in financial markets. And what we should expect in financial markets is, on average, in the long run, our expectation should be that our return is going to come in the form of several uh, factors, if you will. There's an underlying riskless rate that we should earn when we invest our money, when we defer our consumption, we invest for retirement or whatever. And then on top of that, we might try to earn some extra return by taking some risks. And the three main risks that I want to highlight, there are others such as illiquidity, but the three major risks that we can take to try to earn some extra return are interest rate risk, credit risk, and equity market risk. And that's the way that I like to think in terms of financial planning and, and, and where we are. And that is, which risks do we want to take to try to earn more than the riskless rate? Now, you might be thinking to yourself, why take any risks at all? Why is he talking about taking risks? Well, if we don't take any risks at all, we'll end up simply getting a very short-term money market rate. And in the long run, that is rather devastating. I'll show a picture later on that shows how devastating it is not to take any risks. If we, in a nutshell, if we don't take any risks, in my opinion, we're not even going to keep up with inflation on an after-tax basis. So we take risks, which we don't like to take. We take it because
Okay, can, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, we take risks to earn extra return. So let's talk about these three risks. First about the riskless rate, and then about these three risks. Uh, this is a, the two-year uh, treasury yield, uh, and I pick this as a riskless rate. Most people would actually pick a shorter term one, but I think this illustrates the point well. Usually when you invest in this, you should expect a healthy return. But what's happened over the past 40 years is that return has dropped to the point where a few days ago, the yield on a two-year treasury was only one half of 1% per year. Now, uh, if you only earn one half of 1% per year, you're not going to keep up with inflation uh, and uh, you're going to pay taxes on that privilege. So it looks like being in just the riskless rate is not going to generate a positive uh, after-tax return for quite the, uh, quite the potential future. So we need to take risks in order to, uh, in my opinion, have an after-tax positive rate of return. So let's turn to what if we take interest rate risk instead of investing in this two-year Treasury, which has a return a yield rate now of less than 1%, what if we go to a 10-year Treasury? And here we see that over the past 40 years, that yield has come down, down, down. Now, part of that is, is just in a response to our low inflationary environment, but it's more than just that. The, during um, a, a few days ago, the 30-year Treasury had a yield of less than 1%. This is, this is historic. This is uh, unbelievable that you would get a return, this is the 10-year treasury, to get a return of less than 1% on a 30-year treasury is mind-blowingly unusual. So interest rate risk doesn't seem to be a way to, to get out of this problem. It doesn't seem like right now the yields are offering a premium for bearing this type of risk. So what about credit spread risk? Well, if we invest, if we look at the, the, the lines here, the these uh, higher green and blue lines are the yields on uh, lower quality bonds. If we take credit spread risk by investing in risky corporate bonds, are we going to earn a substantial premium? And the answer is no, we're not in an environment right now where by being in, in high risk uh, corporate bonds, we're going to get an exceptional premium. We are going to get a premium, and that should be part of our portfolio, but it's certainly not something we should put all of our money in. And then we come to the equity market. What's the equity market risk premium look like? One way to think about forward-looking returns is to simply ask the question, is our firm's earning net income, earnings per share, that seem to justify an investment in the equity markets. And what we see is, and this is not a fully updated diagram, but things look very dismal in that direction right now. Uh, one way to see this is that the price to earnings ratios are above 20. Well, if price to earnings ratios are, are above 20, it actually means that firms are earning less than 5% uh, returns according to accounting numbers. And that's not perfect, but this is suggestive of the idea that the equity market, even after this correction, is by no means cheap. I remember back in the 19, uh, late 1970s, there were, uh, those of you that are familiar with these sorts of things, there were market to book ratios were underneath one. And uh, the um, earnings yields on a lot of firms were, were double digit. It looked like equities were tremendously underpriced and in retrospect, they were. Well, it doesn't look like equities are underpriced right now. So we're in a difficult environment, a difficult environment where the question becomes this, if we're not going to be in our existing portfolios, if we're not gonna be, for instance, heavily invested in a well diversified portfolios of equities, What's our out? What what could we do? What should we do? And it looks like there are no safe, wonderful places. Uh, I would love it if we had this wonderful answer of uh, an asset class that offered a fabulous return without risk that, that we could park our money in. But if we're, uh, the markets, in my opinion, don't indicate any place right now which would warrant an overinvestment or, or an overweighting. 
this is this is the graph I talked about earlier that I was going to come back to. It's a it's a great graph. It shows cumulative growth in in various asset classes over a period of a hundred years, almost a hundred years. And if we look on the right side, what this is saying is that inflation caused one dollar uh, to it, it makes fourteen dollars today to equal what one dollar was back then. So you have to come up as far as this gray line just to keep up with inflation. And if you look at being in money market accounts, uh, it's just only a little bit better to have been in a money market account, treasury bills, for instance, but that's on a pre-tax basis. So on an after-tax basis, uh, money market investments like treasury bills or money market accounts do not keep up with inflation. And in today's environment, that's doubly true. If we put our money in a money market account right now, if we put a large amount of our money in a money market account, we should expect to lose money on an after-tax basis. Then what about government bonds? Well, government bonds do better, and that's because historically there's been an interest rate risk premium. But there's not much of a yield advantage right now by going into long-term bonds. With a 30-year treasury at 1%, uh, it's more than that now, but um, less than certainly less than 2% yields, that's likely not going to keep up with inflation. Well, then corporate bonds would be somewhere around here. If we invested in corporate bonds, we'd get more. Well, we would get more return, but we would also get more risk. That's certainly a place we should be looking at now to keep some money in. And then there's equities. In the long run, this has been such an appropriate place to be. And if we look at the crashes that we've been through, uh, the previous discussion I had and the previous chart I had, it really brings out, I think in most of us, certainly in me, this idea of, wow, wouldn't it be great if we could just get out of the stock market before it goes down and get back in before it goes up. But this long-term graph really shows something important. And that is that, that it's, it's, if you jump out of the stock market, this is such an overwhelmingly upward trend that the odds are that when you get back into the market, it will be higher than when you got out. That's the problem. You, if, you, if you jumped out of the market here, that's wonderful. But what happens if when you jump out of the market here or here or here or here, you're gonna lose all these incredible returns. So this is really an argument that equities uh, are where the great returns have been over the last 100 years. I believe it's where the great returns will be over the next 100 years, but we don't know what's going to be happening in the next week or two. It could be that this is a quick correction and we regain a, a solid base and start to continue, continue the upward trend, or things could get worse. And I know that's frustrating that we'd like a definitive answer, uh, but we don't have a definitive answer of the short term. I think we have a definitive answer over the long term. And the long term is if we're thinking about uh, planning for a, a, a retirement or for our children's uh, money, the equity market is where most of our money should be. So what are the takeaways from today? And then I'll look forward to fielding some questions. Uh, this may be a, a very good time for you and maybe your spouse, your family to talk with your financial advisor, uh, Tim and Tyler and, and uh, Justin and Adam and uh, to, to see whether your current financial plans are appropriate. I don't think this is a time to make major changes in your financial plans, but it is a very important time for you to talk about how you feel. Uh, is this ruining your, 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 uh, your happiness? Uh, it certainly is not ruining mine. I have an equity exposure that is substantial. I know I've lost an awful lot of money in the past week. It hasn't ruined my day at all. I, I can, I'm always concerned about my clients, but I'm used to this. I feel that in the long run, uh, we'll look back on it and realize that we eventually recovered. And that's what my financial plan is, is more long-term. I've locked in money for, for my needs. And this is really money that um, my kids or grandchildren, much of it would inherit. And um, by, by the time they do that, I hope, which is a long time from now, uh, I'm, I'm confident that having money in the equity markets is the right thing. So uh, you should, I hope you can have that feeling of confidence with your financial plan 
If you don't have that feeling, please talk with your advisor and make sure that we not necessarily make a dramatic change right now, but we certainly uh, memorialize, take seriously the, your feelings as to how much pain you're in right now and to see if maybe you want to go on a path in the future which makes you less subject to that or whether, uh, as I am right now, you feel like you can you have the proper level of risk and that you're just going to weather it in the long run. This is a time to consider opportunistic rebalancing and tax-motivated trading. Uh, this is a great opportunity uh, in, to get out of some securities maybe uh, that, that give you a tax advantage to get out of and to put them into something that, that might be a, a better opportunity. A great thing that you can be doing right now with these new very low interest rates is to consider refinancing. Uh, refinance a mortgage, uh, possibly uh, consolidate debt, make sure you're not uh, using credit cards, uh, credit cards as a borrowing tool. Uh, this is a great time to refinance. This is an opportunity. Uh, might be an opportunity to, to drive your car a lot. The gas prices are going to be real low. So um, these are things that you can do to take advantage of what is available right now and refinancing. Built more capital can help you. We've got opportunities uh, to borrow, uh, in some cases, at, at as low of an interest rate as 1.25%. So please, if you uh, have any debt uh, uh, that, that you could take uh, advantage of lower rates with, talk with uh, Built More Advisor and uh, we can help you with that. The main idea that I wanted to come across with today is that long-term investing should be based upon long-term time horizons. And that's why I went through this idea of looking at underlying factors, why we take risks, why do we take interest rate risk, why do we take credit risk, and most importantly, why do we take equity risk? Well, the reasons that we do that uh, are should be time-tested and we should respond to market conditions in a judicious way. We want to focus on being well diversified. We want to focus on keeping our taxes minimized. We want to keep our, our borrowing or in, uh, other investment related expenses as low as possible. Uh, these are things that we can do that we know is are going to make our life uh, better and uh, make sure that we're taking a level of risk that we can feel comfortable with. Now, certainly we're all feeling a little bit uncomfortable with a lot of things that are, that are going on right now. But the question is, from a long run perspective, are we in the appropriate risk level? That's something to have discussions about. And I'm ready to take questions now. Uh, you may notice, many of you may notice who this is. This is Abbott and Costello with their famous routine of who's on first. And I will try to be a little more helpful than um, uh, Abbott was in, um, in, in uh, answering your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Tim? Don. <laughs> that, that was great, Don. Thank you. Um, I, we did get actually a couple of questions inbound here. Uh, the first one, if I may, <clears throat> uh, comes from um, MJ, and uh, she just uh, asked, I have a 401k. Should I stop contributing to my savings accounts? <laughs> no, no, not at all. That's a, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, so let's, let's talk about fundamentals. It really comes back to that last slide where I talk about how important taxes are. The reason to invest in a 401k is that you're in a reasonably high tax bracket. The reason not to invest in a 401k is because you're in a very low tax bracket and you'd be better off putting your money in a Roth account. So um, assuming a, a normal or a higher than normal tax bracket, this is a great time to be putting money into your 401k. And um, uh, if it's uh, if you're in a period where you you uh, can in a very low tax bracket put it into Roth, investing for the future is a great a great thing to do. Thank you. Great. Another one here that that came over uh, through email. Uh, I have a concentrated stock position. Are there opportunities right now to diversify? Uh, absolutely. That's a great, uh, gives me a great opportunity here. A concentrated stock position is somebody, uh, perhaps because they uh, had the, uh, uh, they were a successful long term employee in a firm uh, like Microsoft, and the stock went up and up and up, and all of a sudden 
50% or more of their wealth is represented in shares of a single firm like Microsoft, uh, this is an ideal time to consider uh, re diversifying better. The, the, the reason not to diversify a concentrated stock position, the only reason, in my opinion, not to diversify a concentrated position in public equities like Microsoft, uh, is, is taxes. That's the reason not to do it. So when the stock market drops like this, you look at the stock and it's gone down and you say, oh, I can't sell it. Well, yes, this is the time to sell it when the taxes will be smallest and to get that money into a diversified equity portfolio. So, uh, yes, this is the time to to see that the, ta the tax burden is less. Uh, the tax burden is the only reason not to diversify. So when the tax burden is less, this is a reason to do more diversifications, uh, especially the more it drops is the more of an opportunity. Don't look at it and think, oh, it's down at a lower level, it'll come back. Well, the stock market itself is at a lower level and in the long run, it'll come back as well. So yes, uh, uh, better time to, uh, this, is, this could be a good time to uh, tax loss, uh, uh, diversify a concentrated stock position, thanks. Great, great answer. Um, another one uh, coming off the field here is, do you think this outbreak or pandemic will present a, a stress or collapse to the banking and financial system? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, and, and by the way, if we went back to the, the crashes that I was talking about where uh, 1987, there was a crash for no apparent reason, in uh, 2000, it was a crash because of the dot-com firms going under. And in 2007, it was the crash that eventually in 2008 led to the financial sector going under. And the roots of the 2007 were financial as well. I think there's a big difference when, uh, when there's an uh, industry that's not in trouble like 87, the crash was rather quick and it recovered quickly because there really was no underlying fundamental problem in 1987. Uh, in 2000, we knew the tech sector, the dot-coms were in trouble, things like Books A Million and uh, these, these firms that were supposedly going to take over the, the world uh, just collapsed, went you know, down 99% to 100%. Well, we knew we could live without those firms. We lived a long time without Books A Million and we could continue to live a long time without it. That's just one of the firms I remember uh, um, was thought to be a competitor to Amazon at that time. But uh, uh, that's not scary to lose uh, a few high-tech firms. But in 2008, the idea that Merrill Lynch was going to go under without a recovery, that was mind-blowing, and that was very scary. I think our financial sector is in tremendously better shape now than it was then. And it's in better shape now because of what happened then. We realize that there can be these sorts of troubles. Uh, I remember I was working on Wall Street um, and the discussion was, uh, you know, what do you do if a particular bank collapses? And we, we had strategies as to how to deal with that. And then we'd come to the question, what would happen if Merrill Lynch collapsed? And we all laughed and said, well, if Merrill Lynch collapsed, the world's over. Well, Merrill Lynch did collapse in, 80, in uh, 2008, and the world was not over. Uh, but the point I'm making is that was a horrible uh, collapse in the financial sector. I don't think that's going to happen again. And I think that's what made things so bad in 2008. I don't think we're headed there, uh, but you never know how much uh, panic could drive this. Thank you. And last one here. Um, are we headed to negative yields on, on our treasury? And if so, are bonds still a safe place to hide? Right. Well, there's two ways. Uh, good question. Uh, there's two ways of saying what, what do we mean by a negative yield? Well, we could literally mean that the nominal or stated interest rate is negative. That's certainly what we're seeing in Europe, and we've seen it for quite a few years. Uh, that's one interpretation of negative yield. Another interpretation of negative yield is to say, well, yes, the Treasury is paying 1%, but inflation is 2%, so we're actually losing 1% and paying taxes on the privilege. Uh, do we mean a negative nominal yield? Uh, it's, it's possible. I don't think it's going to happen. But do we mean a negative after tax, after inflation yield? 
Yes, it's been that way for several years already, and it may be that way on average for many, many more years to come. And I think maybe that's a good question to end on, and that is this, that, that if we put our money in an ultra safe place right now, uh, it's going to be tough to know when to get back into the market. And while we're waiting to decide when to get back into the market, we're going to be experiencing, in my opinion, a negative after tax, after inflation return. Uh, so what is the thing that you should do right now? Uh, as long as your risk, the level of risk that you've been taking is consistent with a rational financial plan, and if you've been working well with your financial advisor, that should be true. This is a normal sort of market event that occurs. It could get worse, it could get better, but the strategy in all of these cases is if you were taking the proper level of risk before this crisis occurred, then you should not consider you should not be making any major changes now. That's the major takeaway point. So what should you be doing? You should be keeping a well diversified portfolio with exposures uh, to you know broad broad exposure and broad diversification to risky assets. And you should be um, staying the course and, and making adjustments in terms of taxes or a few uh, small changes, but you should not be uh, dismantling your portfolio unless you were in an inappropriate risk level. And that's what you should be talking to Tim and Tyler and Adam and Justin about, is to make sure that your risk exposure was right. Uh, and that's part of the financial planning process, and, and that's something we can help you with. Thank you, Tim. Great. Thank you, Don, so much. And, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and attention today. Uh, if you missed anything uh, or would like to send this to other investors, friends, family, colleagues, we'll have a replay available on our website, www.builtmorecap.com. We'll have it on our social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, and we'll also send another uh, repeat replay uh, email out to you guys. Um, and and uh, you know, lastly, I'll just say if, if you have any concerns or questions and want to discuss your particular situation, please don't hesitate to reach out to your advisor. Um, as the poster says, and I'll kind of bring this back to good old Winston Churchill, uh, the poster says, keep calm and carry on, and I'll just say, wash your hands. Thank you, guys. Enjoy your day. <laughs>